You're watching once again a YouTube video presentation of the University of Wyoming Center on Aging. I'm Scott Veach. I'm your host and in this series we'll be discussing topics of interest for those who are caring for loved ones with dementia. We invite you to subscribe to the channel and we hope that you'll hit that thumbs up like button. Both of those actions help our channel to grow and reach more people. And if you'll hit that notification bell, you'll be notified each time we upload a new video. Our guest today is Dr. Kyle Page. He is, uh, specializes in ger geriatric mental health. He has a doctorate in psychology with an emphasis on aging and mental health from the University of North Texas. And he is passionate about improving the care of older adults. Got to put that in. That, that's one of your passions, isn't it? It is a passion, yeah. Good thing to add. Uh, we are at the Rocky Mountain Alzheimer's Summit in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and we are taping this uh, during May of 2022. And yesterday, uh, you had a breakout session where you spoke about assessing the decisional capacity in persons with dementia. So let's just start at ground zero. Why is that important? Oh, gosh. Um, we, I think... 20 words or less. 20 words or less, okay. <laughs> we have lived most of our lives being able to direct it how we wish. Being able to pick what I wear, pick what I eat, pick where I go. And at some point, when you develop dementia, it gets harder to be able to do some of those things. Uh, such to the point that we might get concerned about the decisions you're making, and uh, the timing with your making it, the complexity, things like that. And so sometimes as clinicians, we start to question, when is a good time to introduce more help in how you're making decisions? And so we call that a decisional capacity evaluation. And is that always the starting point? Um, there's probably multiple starting points if we broke it down into like all the little um, avenues in which you know, this question comes up. I would say the most common starting point is you and your loved one, whoever you're kind of caring for, uh, start to notice changes. And perhaps you start to have a conversation about concerns you're noticing, and maybe then that conversation gets taken to your healthcare clinician, and then your healthcare clinician might ask some additional questions about how you're doing, how you're making decisions, and that's a more kind of uh, organic way that it just kind of comes up um, for most people, I would say. Is it usually the loved one who makes the connection, or sometimes this is the dementia person, person himself do it? Uh, yeah, it could be anyone. It could really? even be a really good friend, someone who knows you well and just notices changes in how you're doing, uh, can start asking these kinds of questions. And, and who's qualified to make that decision? Oh, um, so a couple different um, layers to that, but the state of Wyoming, for example, just like any other state in the United States or Washington DC, for example, allows a healthcare clinician, usually a physician, which could include a psychiatrist uh, specifically, mm -hmm. or a psychologist in many states, to be able to ask certain kinds of questions to understand how you're making decisions. And so those are the two professions that traditionally have the qualification uh, to do that kind of assessment. You know, I, I kind of led the conversation in that direction because one of the things you said yesterday was in, in your breakout session talk, you said most clinicians report little or no training in how to assess capacity. No. Wow, that, that just seems crazy to me. What the <laughs> <laughs> it, it's scary. Scary right? is I, I the think, word, it, yes. I think, I can think of it on a personal level and I can think of it on a professional level, but it's, it's a scary thought that to be a clinician who has this power, really, to be able to determine whether you can make decisions about your medical care, and perhaps that goes to a court system where now a court decides this. But if you look at the training we provide, it's, 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 it's relatively little to none. Even the training that I provided uh, yesterday, just in one hour, is more than what most people get uh, just through their graduate school training to become doctors or psychologists or something. Is that a, is that a loophole? Is that a, an omission? Is that... Um... I would, I don't, I've never viewed it as an intentional omission. I think um, capacity and this idea of, of who gets to make the decision doesn't belong to anyone. Hmm. Right? Okay. So like 
It's not a psychiatrist thing. It's not a psychologist thing. It's not a geriatrician thing. We are relevant players in thinking through this, but it doesn't belong to any one person. And so you get different ideas about what's good enough training and what's a, an appropriate way to assess it. And so it, it's, it's, it's been a long history of no consensus that we're just trying now to, to kind of build that up. One of the things you also said was that clinical evaluations often have legal and ethical ramifications. Um, I, I want to ask you what the legal and ethical ramifications could be, but that sounds pretty um, ominous. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. does that kind of make clinicians maybe shy away from wanting to get involved? Yeah, you know, in my experience, um, so I do a lot of training on how to do these e evaluations, and a lot of them are um, scared to use that term again because it, it could be life-altering. It often is life-altering for that person living with dementia and kind of the care network around them. And after maybe they do this training and they learn about these ethical and legal ramifications, mm -hmm. they get even more scared about what's at stake and what if I make the wrong decision. So one kind of ramification, one kind of consequence of something like this is let's say someone comes to me in the hospital, I evaluate them, I ask them questions about their medical care, about what they want for their medical care, about the treatment options. I ask all these kinds of questions to look at how they're understanding the situation. And if I determine you are having a really hard time understanding your medical options, I might say, maybe you shouldn't be the one to make the medical decision. We should rely on someone else. The legal side of that is that could be taken to a court of law. And now a judge gets involved and says, you legally cannot make decisions about your life. And we're talking financial decisions sometimes. We're talking just day-to-day -day life decisions about how, I don't know, where you live, things you do day-to-day. It starts as like a natural conversation between a doctor and someone you know that you're seeing, mm -hmm. but it can certainly go very heavily onto this legal side that can remove your foundational rights of just how you choose to lead your life, right? So it very much can alter some very basic uh, human rights that we have. Does it ever get into a matter of definition what capacity and what incapacity are? Yes, um, so we've come a long way over thousands of years about how we want to define it. We are doing a better job in the last few years now of coming to a consensus agreement on what capacity means and what it means to not have capacity. As clinicians, as healthcare doctors, uh, just talking with individuals. And we've come up with kind of four core things that maybe we'll come back to, but four core things that we look for. But on the legal side, which is a different side of the, a different perspective, they also have come to some kind of consensus and they develop some kind of definition on what uh, capacity means. Or a lot of times you hear the word incompetency, uh, depending on what state you're in. And one of the fascinating things for me is that every state gets to make their own uh, definition. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Oh gosh, it depends <laughs> on how you want to look at it. I think it makes it challenging if you move between states. What, yes, if, what uh -huh. if you're an adult child trying to help your parent who's in a different state, right? Your state that you live in as the adult child might have a different definition than where your parent is living, right? And so you want to be familiar with how states uh, perceive what capacity means. You could see it as a positive thing perhaps because who makes the definition? Right? The legal definition are made by these uh, uh, lawmakers that we elect. Right? And so in a sense, they represent us. And they're us. Right? And so it's, it's we are the ones deciding what it means to have capacity or competency. So perhaps it's a good thing in some respect that every state does it slightly differently because it's representing what the people of that state want it to mean. And so it's a way you could look at it. You're watching Once Again, which is a YouTube video presentation of the University of Wyoming Center on Aging. If you haven't done so already, we invite you to subscribe to our channel. We hope that you'll hit that thumbs up like button. Both of those actions will help our channel to grow and allow us to reach more people. We hope you do those things. And then also don't forget to tap that notification bell because when you do that, then you'll be automatically notified every time that we upload a new video. So thank you for doing those things. What about, um, you know, we talked about the timeline. Um, sounds like 
we're getting better, but we got a ways to go. A long ways to go. Um, we are trying in, in our own ways, like the training that we did yesterday, to just kind of let people know about the advancements and how we think about capacity as people, as a society, how we think about it from a legal perspective, and how to assess it. It's more than just asking, how are you doing? What's going on, mm -hmm. right? It ideally is a conversation, and we're trying to train as many people as we can in how to have those conversations. And so we still have a long way to go because there's lots and lots of misconceptions about what it means to have capacity, particularly if you're someone who is living with dementia. Um, Capac mis misconceptions such as? Yeah, so some big ones is that if you've been diagnosed with dementia, Alzheimer's disease for example, um, that therefore you can't make decisions. Because if you have dementia, that means brain trouble, and that must mean trouble making decisions about your day-to-day -day life, finances, things like that. That's a big misconception. Um, going forward, for, you know, where would, judging by the progress being made, where would you like to, to see things in 10 years? Oh, in 10 years, um, one of the things that I think we're trying to do more of now is to standardize how you ask the questions. And not like a checkbox, yes, no, click kind of right. thing, but to at least give people more tools about how to assess, how to have that conversation. That started in the 80s, believe it or not, with creating these kinds of like questions that we could all use. Um, but a lot of people don't know that exists. A lot of people don't know that those questions tie back to legal definitions, and that's a great way to kind of match what you're doing with how your state thinks about capacity, how clinicians think about capacity, versus just asking whatever you feel like is appropriate, right? So that's where we started, and we're trying to do more of that. I think where I'd like to see us in 10 years is that we're probably engaging in these kinds of conversations earlier. Right? Don't wait until it's a crisis. Earlier in the diagnosis? Earlier in the diagnosis, mm -hmm. pre-diagnosis, before any diagnosis comes up, at the first sign that you notice something is not right. right? We know it takes years sometimes for someone to get a diagnosis from first sign that something feels off. Um, we want to encourage families, we want to encourage doctors and, 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 and you working with your doctor to have these conversations about what's important for you in your life, what's important for your dementia care, your health care, and what will happen if it comes to a time that you can't make decisions. Who do you want to tell you that? Who, want you, who do you want to be part of that conversation? How do you want us to dis disclose that to you? Mm -hmm. right? And you want to know that before it's a crisis in the emergency department and, and it just everything feels just kind of um, like chaos. So, Which is a, a perfect segue into the next part I wanted to ask you because you talked about uh, the decision-making abilities, what they are. You mentioned understanding, appreciation, reasoning, and choice. What are those? Yeah, so these are four core abilities that you can do. Your brain is, 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 does amazing things, right? It helps you pay attention. It helps you learn new material. It helps you remember it later. It helps you speak but it also helps you make decisions, right? And when we break that down into the small details of what it means, what are the steps to make a decision? Those are the elements. There are four steps that we look at. You have to understand, uh, think of medical for example. You have to understand your medical diagnosis. You have to understand the pros and cons of the different treatments that the doctor might be talking to you about. You have to be able to then appreciate what that means for your own situation, your own life, what you value and what's important to you. You have to reason or think through all these different options, juggle what feels most important for you. And then at the end of the day, kind of express what you want, pick an option, right? And so we break it down very specifically to these four steps on how to make a decision. And that's kind of what we're training providers, clinicians to kind of think through. Is this kind of the ground zero? Yeah, this, this would be the starting point. Yeah. So when we, if we were to talk to someone about their decision making, that's a core piece of it, those four things, but it's not all of it, right? We'd want to know your values, your history, what's important to you. We'd because that changes to, person to person. Person to person yeah. and even mm -hmm. over time. You know, values are, are t do tend to be a bit core and, and, and longstanding, but they can change. Particularly if now you have a dementia diagnosis, and so a lot of times when I meet someone who gets that diagnosis, I talk to them, now think about this diagnosis, does that change anything for you? 
Does that change how you want to spend your time? What's a priority for you? Where you want your, your, your energy to go? And that might change your advanced directive. It might change kind of uh, how you want your care to be done. And so you always want to have these conversations person to person, but over time. We think about mental health. How are you doing? How are you feeling? We think about medically, physically, how are you doing? Right? Are you taking medicines okay? Are you feeling okay? We're looking at how you can physically move around the house. So there's a lot of pieces that factor into it. You mentioned something else too. I, I saw here in my notes that um, you stressed the importance of constant monitoring. Yes. Um, one of the unfortunate things, as, as most of us uh, observe or experience with dementia, is that a lot of these are progressive. So month after month, year after year, it gets more and more challenging for that individual living with dementia to uh, pay attention, to remember things, to make decisions about what to wear, about what to eat. Um, and we know that if you have a dementia diagnosis, you can make many, if not most, of the decisions about your day-to-day -day life, even big medical decisions. But as dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, for example, progresses, it's gonna get harder. And so we want to keep monitoring that individual over time because it might get to a point, it usually gets to a point, where it becomes incredibly difficult to keep track of the conversations with the doctor, to keep track of your medical care, and to make a choice about what you want to happen. I have this next point, point that you mentioned, uh, this in capital letters. You said support before you subtract. Yes. <laughs> Trying to play with the, with the S's there. Support, right. <laughs> support before you subtract. There has been a, a movement historically that if you had a diagnosis of dementia, if, uh, if that happened, we thought you couldn't make decisions. And so we would subtract your rights. We would subtract your participation. We would not invite you to the conversation anymore about your medical care, about your dementia care, right? And that time has changed. We're hoping it's still changing, right? that we are involving people with dementia as much as possible. Right? And so we want to support how well you can participate in a conversation with us. And we could do very basic things. They feel so basic, but can't underestimate it. We can speak at a slightly slower pace. Right? Not baby talk, not talk down to mm -hmm. people, but to give the brain time to process what's being said, to understand what's being said. I could write things down on a piece of paper so you can look at it and hear it. That way you're using your vision and you're using your hearing to be a part of the conversation. I could help you find a picture to make sense of the medical care that we're talking about. These are ways that if you use those uh, strategies, you can actually better engage somebody with dementia in the conversation. And they can actually make a decision just like everybody else who does not have dementia because we're supporting them before saying, okay, there's no point trying. You're not gonna understand. And so we're trying to change the, the, the movement here. We're trying to change the emphasis on how to engage people and support them as much as possible. So it almost sounds like you're approaching it from the positive rather than from the negative. You, yes, so I'm a big advocate, uh, big advocate for that um, because when you talk about dementia care, unfortunately, there are a lot of negative aspects that, that get discussed, right? Mm -hmm. It's not easy to talk about. What you about. can't do. Yeah, yeah, what you can't do, um, what's, what's impaired sometimes if we, we use those words in the, in the healthcare setting. Um, and sometimes like that's part of the evaluation. That's part of what we're trained to do as clinicians, but it doesn't have to be the only thing we do as clinicians, right? So how can we look for strengths? How can we look for what's important to you and leverage that to keep you involved and keep you engaged in the conversation? And then one of the last notes I have, you said cognition is only part <laughs> of the picture. Yes, oh, this, this could be a whole nother conversation. <laughs> um, there, there's this idea that when you make a decision about maybe what car you're going to buy or uh, where you're going to live or what medical um, kind of treatment you're going to pursue, that there's this, this false idea that you will sit down with a piece of paper and you will write down all the options and you will write down all the pros and cons to every single option and that you will slowly think through all of that. Now, some people do that. My wife does it all the time. But most people don't go to that level, right? Um, and as you age, because of the way that the brain changes for all of us, all of us, whether you have dementia or not, it changes how you approach decision-making. 
So it's not all about memory. It's not all about concentration. It's not all about speaking, but it's also about uh, what's important to you. It's also about who's important in your life. It's also about um, these kind of mental shortcuts. Your brain has a way of, of helping you out and, and making these kind of shortcuts to, to make your decision faster. And as you grow older, what we have learned uh, through all the research that we've done is that you approach decision making slightly differently. Okay? This doesn't apply to everyone, but some older individuals uh, don't ask as many questions of their doctor. Some of that is because of when they grew up and what a doctor, who a doctor was, and some of that is because of how the brain is changing. But if you don't know that, and you're sitting here talking, you and I, and I don't hear you asking me questions, I don't want to misinterpret that as you're uninterested or you're unable to participate. It's just you have a different approach. And so we were trying to encourage people to be aware it's not all about memory. It's not all about how your brain is functioning uh, and, and how you want it to function, but there's many other pieces. Mental health, how well you're feeling today. If you're really stressed out, you're not going to approach decision making probably in the same way as when you feel calm. Right? And so we want to be thinking about all of these pieces of the puzzle uh, to help someone um, and to support them through decision making. You alluded to something a couple of minutes ago, and I agree uh, wholeheartedly that we probably have at least two or three more programs to <laughs> stuff to discuss before we begin to really catch on the topic. But uh, uh, anything else that we missed that we should cover before we... Uh, conclude? Oh gosh, we covered some good ground. I yeah. think the one thing I, I would always stress, and I feel like we did say this, but it's important to have these conversations early. right? Have the conversations about what you want for your care, document it, uh, and, and kind of find someone you trust who can speak to what you want if the time should come. It's incredibly important um, as dementia progresses. Our guest today has been Dr. Kyle Page. He has a doctorate in psychology with an emphasis on aging and mental health from the University of North Texas. He specializes in geriatric mental health. And as you can tell, he is passionate about improving the care of older adults. Thanks so much for being with yeah, us today. Thanks for having me, Scott. You've been watching once again a YouTube video presentation of the University of Wyoming Center on Aging. We invite you to subscribe to our channel. We hope that you'll hit that thumbs up like button. Those actions will help our channel to grow and reach more people. And if you'll tap that notification bell, you'll be notified automatically each time we upload a new video. I'm Scott Veach. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll see you again next time.